Um, thank you so much, Community Action, for being here today. Um, this is one of our annual really significant spotlight events. Um, today's commemoration webinar in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is something that the partnership has done for several years. And we are pleased today to welcome you to this um, commemoration. Hopefully you got some little dancing into with our opening musical selections. Um, just want to recognize our keynote speaker, um, Maria Elena de la Carza, selected some of our playlists today. So thank you for that. And as we start here, as we start all of our sessions, um, we do want to start with a land acknowledgement. Next slide, please. Every community all over um, this country and this, and this globe honors its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making history that led us to this very moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in, light, in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this generation, on, on this land, excuse me, for more generations than we can count. Next slide, please. I want to recognize that today's meeting, where I'm sitting here today in Washington, D.C., is being truly held on the lands of the Piscataway and Anacostian peoples. And I pay my respect to the elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I encourage you to put into the chat window um, a recognition and an acknowledgement of the lands that you are sitting on. We've seen in the chat window already, there are people from all over uh, today to come together, to commemorate, to recognize, to celebrate, as well as to be together in this moment in time. So thank you so much for being with us. Next slide, please. Today, we're going to have a welcome from our board chair. Um, the Litzo Sulamoyo is our board chair and the executive director CEO at the Champaign-Urbana um, Regional Planning Commission. Sorry, De Litzo, I always call it Champaign-Urbana. I know it's Champaign, sorry about that. And our keynote address will be provided by Maria Elena de la Carza, the CEO of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz in California. We are thrilled to have both of them with us here today. We're also going to give you some additional resources at the end of today's webinar that you can take and work with your own organization, with family and friends, with your board, and you personally as we all grow and develop and pursue our own learning. Next slide, please. I want to start with the promise of community action. You know, you can't go anywhere without us really grounding ourselves in the promise. And today, I think it really different parts resonate every day for you, right? Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. And today, the part that we care about the entire community is what's really resonating with me. Next slide, please. Dr. King's dream is central to our promise. And our two speakers here today are going to provide their own um, impassioned um, presentation today about what this moment in time means to them. And in community action, we come to this work because we believe everyone should have the access and the opportunity for success. And in community action, we have our roots in the same soil as the civil rights movement. We are called to action. We understand that poverty in this country is grounded and rooted in structural and systemic racism. And we in community action speak truth. We wanna live in the, to, to an authentic real narrative on poverty in America and Today is a moment in time for us to come together and have a conversation. Next slide, please. Our value statements also ground us in today's conversation. We highlighted the first bullet here, right? We believe that all people, all people should be treated with dignity and respect and recognize that structural race, gender, and other inequities remain barriers that must be addressed. 
If we're going to move the needle on poverty, if we're going to move the needle in equity, we need to ground ourselves again in the true narrative of poverty. I'll also just highlight the second bullet because for me it resonates today as well, that we believe this nation has the capacity and moral obligation to ensure that no one is forced to endure the hardships of poverty. We all come to this work from a different place. And sometimes I often talk about, um, I come from this work in terms of a faith perspective, for instance. But we are a secular movement, but we are grounded in this moral obligation. And today's webinar, talking about Dr. King's legacy and how we live the promise of community action every day for me, those two parts of our value statements truly stand out. Next slide, please. So our vision as a network is, an is a nation that creates opportunities for all people to thrive, build strong, resilient communities, and ensures a more equitable society. That resilience factor is real. We, we have to be resilient. We have to build resilient communities. But by ensuring that we build a more equitable society, let's ensure that the systems that we create, the policies we create, ease that need for individual resiliency. Next slide, please. So equity, how does it show up in a lot of our work here at the partnership? A shout out, I know Delitzo also chairs our Equity and Economic Mobil uh, Mobility Commission. Maria Elena also sits on that commission. This is a board-defined, board-seated commission that is national in scope, has representatives from all over the nation, focusing and grounding all of our work in equity. We have a website, one of our landing pages has a tremendous amount of tools and resources. We're going to be putting that into the chat and talking about that later today. We do a number of um, trainings and resources just yesterday. Um, the National Day of Racial Healing, the partnership hosted racial healing circles for, for community action. And our board has declared racism as a public health crisis. So I hope that you see we take in some ways the, 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 the passion for the work and actually do the work as well. But as, as Tiffany Marley, our senior vice president, who's behind the scenes here, and you'll hear see her later today as well, tells us, right, in order to do the work, we have to do our work. And that's what part of today is about, is doing our work. Next slide, please. And so our North Star. This work is our North Star. We lean into it. We look towards it. Everything we're doing is striving for that. So collectively, let's, as a community action network, continue to look in the right direction towards the path of opportunity and thriving for everyone. Everyone. We care about the entire community. Next slide, please. So again, thank you everyone for being here today. I am so pleased to introduce, uh, many of you know Delitzo Sulamoyo, our board chair. He is the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission CEO. He's been on our board for a number of years. He's been a friend of mine for more than 15. Excited that he's with us here today. Delitzo, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. And um, thank you so much for being with us and for your leadership. Thank you so much, Denise, uh, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm honored today to make a few remarks uh, as we commemorate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Dr. King uh, is a brother. Uh, I'm connected to Dr. King through my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, of which he was a member. And as we believe in my fraternity, he still is a member, only participating through our Omega chapter. So as we commemorate and celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I cannot help but think about what he would observe if he were still alive today. He would find a country and world still struggling with the many ills of social and economic injustice he fought against more than five decades ago. He would find that even though there has been great progress made, we still have a long way to go to get to a perfect union and to the promised land. He would find that African-Americans are still facing police brutality and mass incarceration for many crimes that their counterparts are imprisoned for much less time. 
he would find that our communities are deluged with gun violence. He would find, as he stated, that the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort and the inner city of poverty and despair have not been completely crushed with the forces of justice. He would find that, as he stated, that those that live on the outskirts of hope have not been fully brought into the metropolis of daily security. Finally, he would find a country so divided against political lines that it has paralyzed progress on many fronts. But Dr. King would be comforted to know that he left a great legacy and blueprint for his work to continue despite the challenges that exist today. He will be pleased to know that there are more soldiers who come from different backgrounds, race, creed, sexual orientation, and identify against racial, social, and economic injustice. They are children of former slaves and former slave owners who have joined hands to fight against oppression in this country. He would be pleased to know that the community action movement is still fighting for those living at the social and economic margins of our society. Our network through the leadership of the National Community Action Partnership has continued to fashion itself on the ideals of doc that Dr. King set forth for the world. There are great parallels between Dr. King's I Have a Dream and I've Been to the Mountaintop speeches with a promise of community action. As Dr. King envisioned a country that ensured equitable access to the American dream, community action agencies have continued to collectively change people's lives, embody the spirit of hope, improve communities, and we are striving and working hard to make America a better place to live for everyone during these trying times. Community Action believes in the promise that everyone should have access to the opportunity for success. Dr. King saw a correlation between poverty and racial injustice, which is why he led the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. The intersectionality that exists among poverty, racism, and discrimination is the reason why we must continue to fully engage in our racial equity work. We believe that all people should be treated with dignity and respect and recognize that structural racism, gender, and other inequities remain barriers that must be addressed, which is why Community Action established the Equity and Economic Mobility Commission at the national level. And the commission continues to lead on com community racial healing and relationship building, narrative change, immigration and migration, public safety, criminal justice reform, housing, health equity, energy justice, and food security, to mention just a few. Finally, as Dr. King did, community action continues to believe that this nation has the capacity and moral obligation to ensure that no one is forced to endure the hardships of poverty and discrimination. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Delitzo. We really appreciate your words, your inspiration, your leadership. So thank you so much for that. I am very excited now to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Um, those of you in California have likely crossed paths with, have heard Maria Elena speak before. Um, I've been blessed to be able to spend time with her on the Equity and Economic Mobility Commission, getting to know her. She is a true leader, a true inspiration. Maria Elena de la Carza is the CEO of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County in California. She's going to share a bit about herself, um, but what I liked about her bio that she provided to us, I'm just going to read it. 
not about her necessarily experience, her academic background. It's, I stand on the values of equity, humility, and service to lead the agency to expand services, strengthen engagement, become culturally reflective, and experience significant financial growth. The first thing in her bio is about the agency and about the network and how she brings herself to this work. An amazing inspiration. Maria Elena, thank you so much for being with us here today. We're going to turn the ball over to you and we welcome you into this space. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. What an honor and a privilege to be with you today. Denizio, thank you for those words. Thank you for grounding us in MLK's amazing legacy. Denise, thank you for the wonderful, warm introduction. Um, uh, I want to thank the 198 people who decided to log in today. Um, I want to thank the NCAP partners for choosing me to have this conversation with you. Um, and I want to, before I jump in, I want to say to you, um, interaction is really important to me. My energy feeds off your energy. And when sharing the, the, the story that I got to do this Zoom with you today, someone said, how wonderful that it's through Zoom and not in person. And I said, you know, in person is sometimes easier because there's interaction. I look at your eyes, you look at my eyes, I get to connect with you, you get to connect with me, and it just builds the energy and the momentum. And so I'm gonna invite you as I go through this PowerPoint um, to interact with us through chat. If something I say to you resonates, tell me in chat. If something, uh, a fire builds a fire in you, tell us in chat. Um, and as I start with an, uh, the humble introduction of who I am, um, uh, tell me if you're in alignment with any of the ways that I choose to, to describe myself today. I wanna know. I want to know if you are a Latina CEO. Tell me. I want to know if you are a, um, a, a, a married professional with no children. Tell me. I want to know. So please interact with me in the chat and help me feel the energy that I hope you can feel from me. Um, I want to start off by, by giving voice to this incredible quote that is the underpinning of this conversation. If I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. And so today is about understanding what small things we as individuals bring to community action and how those small things build great ways and great responses. Next slide, please. So today you're gonna to hear three stories. Who is this fat Latina talking to you today? You're gonna to learn about my wonderful agency where I work in the community where I am, I represent. Um, and you're, we're gonna talk a little, about, a little bit about equity and community action. Next slide, please. Thank you, I see you, I see you. I see you in the chat, keep chatting with me. So, quién soy yo? Who am I? Um, and I invite you to look at these beautiful pictures. Let, let, before I jump there, let me say I had a little humpy, Humpty Dumpty uh, uh, bump on my head lot yesterday, and I went to ER and I'm fine. But they did say you might be really emotional today, and so I'm just telling you right now. I might just be emotional today in this conversation with a bump or without a bump. It just might. It is what it is today. And so who am I? I am the daughter of Maria de la Garza Vargas, Maria Apolonia de la Garza Vargas in the blue dress on the bottom right corner. And the daughter of Juvencio de la Garza in the green shirt and the cowboy hat. My dad was born in 1902. My mom was born in 1945. I was the last of six of their children. But rumor has it that back in the day, my father had 27 kids and I'm the last one. I'm the last one of the 27. Uh, and that's me in the little green dress, by the way. I am a sister to Lillian Lilonga de la Garza Langarica 
in the red dress and her and I drinking coffee there in the picture. I am the younger sister, she is the older sister, and she is this incredible warrior mother who has sustained her family through the biggest of challenges and with the biggest of hearts. Um, I am the auntie of three beautiful children, Umberto, Lily, and Aidan, um, who fill me with joy and um, help me wake up in the mornings. I am a longtime community action person. I was a Head Start baby. When my father died, um, when I was eight years old, CAB, this CAB in Santa Cruz County, offered DMV classes to, in Spanish uh, for women. And so my mom didn't speak English and couldn't drive when she died, when my dad died. CAB offered a program and she would take me to the classes where she was learning to drive. Um, my first job was with CAB when I was 16 and my sister too um, was uh, worked for CAB. Um, and we used to take care of the migrant farm workers' children who would be dropped off at 5.30 in the morning up to the fairgrounds. And we would literally hold babies for hours on end while their parents were picking strawberries. I have 32 years of nonprofit experience. I'm a wife. You see my hubby there in the right, on the left, top left corner. Um, I'm, an, I'm a wife of a wonderful, loyal, brilliant husband who is on the spectrum. Um, I'm a dog mom um, in the, the, the one with my husband, that's my former puppy Nino. And the one on the right side is my current puppy Julio the 18th, who is a handful. Um, I am a representative of the fat community. I used to weigh 350 pounds. I, I am working every day and my goal is to get to, oh, I don't know, minus 15 more before my birthday next month. We'll see. I'll, I'll take five. Um, I am a Latina, a proud Latina, Mexican American, Chicana, um, with a German Jewish grandmother on my dad's side but a mom from Mexico, Apulco, Jalisco. I am a feminist before I knew what feminist was. I'm a child sexual abuse survivor. Um, I am an aqua zumbist. I am a poet. I am a dancer. And because of my mom, I learned to be an activist, not in the way you would imagine. My mom and dad were restaurant owners and my sister and I, literally grew up um, in the restaurant every day. And in Watsonville, where is where I'm talking to you from now, Watsonville, California, which is on the central coast, um, there was, a, you might remember, there was a lot of strikes in our history. Um, Huelgas uh, with Cesar Chavez leading those efforts. And my mom and, and our family never went out to march or hold signs or talk on the megaphones. What my mom did is she would get up at three o'clock in the morning, here comes the emotion, and make hundreds of burritos and deliver them to those on the front lines of the strike. That's my example of activism. And I wanna say that as I was preparing for this speech today, Maria Gatin from our, our community here said to me, you, Maria it, it was an activist, um, probably in the 60s and 70s. She's a community leader here in Santa Cruz County. And she said to me through social media, Maria Elena, you are what we were fighting for years ago. And so I wanna thank those activists that are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. Rebecca Garcia, uh, Esther Medina, who's no longer with us, Olivia Mendiola, those activists that taught us and fought for us to have space and platform because we wouldn't be here without you. We wouldn't be here without you. Next slide, please. So I wanna share how my mom taught us. And these are some dichos, some sayings, some learnings. My mom didn't make these up. She just was the transfer of the stories. 
And I want to ask you if you know how to end, end the saying, put it in the chat. My favorite one and the one that I think about every day. Dime con quien andas y te diré quién eres. Tell me who you walk with and I will tell you who you are. And by the looks of 205 people on this webinar, we have an incredible, an incredible network of strength. Lo que haga mi mano derecha, que nunca sepa la mano izquierda. What my right hand does, may my left hand never know about it. And my favorite one, that is in alignment to MLK and his quote about small ways. Cada quien pone su granito de arena. Cada quien necesita poner su granito de arena. Everyone puts needs, contributes their little grain of sand. Grain of sand, granito de arena. It's about our individual small contributions that all come together for a larger picture, a larger movement. Next slide, please. So who is CAB? Who is the agency that I get to represent? And I wanna to say to all the CABistas on the call today, gracias for your work. Gracias for showing up. Gracias for doing what you do and how you do it. And I wanna also recognize those others who are not in my agency for showing up and doing what you do and putting in that granito every day. Our mission is to partner with the community to eliminate poverty and create social change through advocacy and essential services. Our vision is a thriving, equitable, and diverse community free from poverty and injustice. And what I am so incredibly proud of is the soul of the agency, which are, are which is highlighted and shown in our values. And you can see and get to know who we are by looking at those values. Equity leads the pack, right? We are committed to economic, political, and social justice, dignity and diversity. We believe every person has value and is worthy of dignity and respect. Service, compassion, humility, and partnerships are the hallmark of our work for, with one another. Community action, collective action, and advocacy empower and com the community and create change. And inclusion, inclusion, the community shall be a voice in shaping our work. And there I please, I draw attention to this beautiful photograph of this incredible staff at Community Action Board, Santa Cruz County. Next slide, please. We, all, we have four pillars, five pillars of service, homelessness prevention and intervention services, immigration legal services and advocacy, community building and youth services, youth adult employment and reentry services, and as you can see by the pictures, emergency response. Our little community, Santa Cruz County in Watsonville, Capitola and the city of Santa Cruz made the national news because we just survived one of, if not the biggest storm I have ever seen in this community. Um, and, and I will say that um, the, res the emergency response was incredible, not just of CAB, but every one of our networks, including the United Way, our jurisdictional partners, everyone showed up. But I want to stress, in four days, 40,000 sandbags were made. 40,000 sandbags were made. And though the story, those who showed up to make them, those who showed up to volunteer to make them, were our day workers, were our homeless work crew, and were our parents of the kids in our program. They showed up on January 1st to start making sandbags and didn't end until we saw a little bit of blue skies. That's community action. Next slide, please. We see about a cab, we see about 11,000 clients per year. We have a budget of about $8 million. We have a staff about 75 mas o menos. Um, uh, it kind of grows and comes down. Um, and I'm very proud that one of our focus areas is to continue building our language justice and our language capacity by, by recruiting and hiring and contracting with 
people who speak indigenous language, Mixteco, Triqui, Zapoteco, in our community. And so that's who we are. Who is our community? You can look up the data, look up Watsonville, look up Santa Cruz County. You can get the demographics, you can get the percentages, but this is how I'm gonna describe my community. We are a community of farm workers and immigrants. We are a community of, of the highest population of youth when we look at the demographics, our youth numbers are incredibly high. We um, have our big, this, what we're known most, everyone knows about Santa Cruz and the beautiful beaches in Santa Cruz. And Watsonville is about 14 miles south of it. And it is where Martinelli Sparkling Cider is. It is where we Driscoll's and Giant and Ryder Berries are. And it's, it is where we pick our strawberries and our apples. Um, we also have a North uh, community, the community of Davenport, which is an art, 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 artist community. It is a retired community. And it, we have about 25 to 35 seniors who live up there by themselves. And we have 250 farm worker families that pick our Brussels sprouts who live in the migrant, in the camps around the Davenport community. Um, our county has been hit extremely hard uh, with COVID, with the fires, and most recently, as I shared with the floods. We have a small but strong black community who, who are activists and who are pushing and changing things in our community and are leading the way and walking with us, um, with us to, to continue to change the systems that we deal with. Next slide, please. Our local poverty realities, our Santa Cruz County median income is $82,000. We have a little over 13% living below the poverty rate. We have 39% of our folks uh, are renters in what used to be the Stone District. It, uh, it's changed a little bit, but we have a high percentage of renters. The Watsonville median income is 55,000. Notice the difference. Um, we have 14.8%, a little bit more living before the below the poverty rate in Watsonville. 9,000 of our community members are farm workers. I'd like to raise awareness that the farm, average farmer income in our community is $12,000 to $20,000 annually. We have 44, 45% of renters in our district. And I just wanna say overall in our county, the average rate, rent for a 707 square foot space is over $3,000. Thank you, next slide. So what does poverty or economic justice look like in our community and in your community? I don't think that there's anything in these boxes that you don't see in your areas, right? We see children living in poverty. We see low wage workers, farm workers and service workers. We see high unemployment and high underemployed. You know, one of our cap plan questions in the last, the last series what um, the, the highest need was employment, not because people weren't working, but, be, but because people were earning low wages and because there wasn't enough hours. So underemployed is a really big factor in our community. As I shared, extremely high rents. And in Watsonville specifically, South Santa Cruz County, what, what homelessness looks like, um, Throughout the county, homelessness looks like probably what it looks like in your community where folks, we can see our homeless sheltered residents, uh, our unsheltered residents, you know, in the streets and in the parks and in gathered in different areas and in homeless shelters. But in Watsonville specifically, what we see is extremely high density living where there's one family in that 707 square foot space paying 3,330,000, $3,300 a month paying rent, but needing to have three families, four families, five families coming together to afford the rent. Um, we've been severely impacted, as I said, with the pandemic, the fires and the flood. We have our middle income earners are struggling, our teachers, our blue collar workers, our service providers, our nonprofit workers. Um, we, are, we have a huge number of immigrants and single parents and seniors and young parents, our indigenous language speakers. There's limited access to services. The systems that exist don't necessarily touch the people impacted by these areas. There's uh, pressures on youth and just recently our community has been assessing the mental health of our youth. 
with the pandemic, as an impact of the pandemic. Us, like you, have learned that our youth and our parents are struggling still in the recovery phase of the pandemic. And of course, health disparities, right? We know what health disparities look like and we learned what health disparities look like, especially with the pandemic and with crisis response. Next slide, please. So how, how does a community respond? What CAB does locally and what community action does nationally, right? We do our assessments. That CAP plan, I am the biggest cheerleader for the community action plan process. That is a tool. And sometimes it's a little bit dormant. And sometimes we bring out the same old survey and we administer it again and again. And then we just put away our results after we send it to the state. For us, it's a living, breathing document, and we use it as such, and we want to engage with our community in a way that has never been done before. Our board has been extremely dedicated. Our team, led by Paulina Moreno, is extremely dedicated to ensure that we're asking the right questions. Who's asking the question? How do we engage? Where do we engage? And how do we touch those voices that do not traditionally come to the mic, right? not traditionally coming to the mic. And so we have a pretty elaborate plan of how we engage with, with partners, how we sit through in front of the kitchen table and have these conversations because that engagement helps us not only identify gaps, I wanna say, it also for us identifies the assets because to me, the solution for poverty is in the assets of the community. And so we need to understand the full story and how to tell it and identifying using data, using data to tell the story and being able to identify those little granitos, those little grains of sand that will make the most profound difference. You know, I, I've been in nonprofits for a long, long time and, the, and I was in a training that one said, find the rudder. So here's the ship and here's the rudder and the rudder goes like this and the whole ship turns. And the rudder goes like this and the whole ship turns. Find the rudder. We have to find the rudder to move the whole ship. We, we have to continue to explore policy and distribution of resources and pushing the envelope. We just did a community assessment. We locally, in partnership with everyone, we were a participant in that local assessment, identifying the need to build nonprofit and CBO capacity for policy. It is a weak link for us. And, and I would say, how do we as a national network push and learn more about policy and learn more about the system so that we can continue, continue to affect change? Linkages to services and identifying barriers to services. That's how do we respond? You know, when we had the emergency um, of COVID, we were one of the 12 selected agencies to provide disaster relief for immigrants. Um, and this was focused for our undocumented families. And we learned so many lessons about who were the furthest people away from those resources. What were the barriers for folks like, you know, having to, 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 to have a cell phone, having to have email to correspond with, with the funding source. Just all these layers of barriers that systems create that people cannot access. And so our job, our job as community action agencies is to do this work, do it well with a smile on our face, with integrity, with, with commitment, and ensure that there's an equity lens. What is the role of racism and white supremacy in the system, in our system, in our agency? It exists. What is the language just, what are the language justice issues that exist in my agency, in my community, in my county, in my state, in my nation? And I have to call it out how immigration status has to be part of our immigration, of our equity lens. Because if I'm undocumented and I cross the border and I get here because I want a better life for my family and I may not speak English or Spanish, I need to know, I need someone to see me. I need someone to see me. And community action, if it ain't us, people don't get seen. Next slide, please. And so I wanna talk about our granitos. What 
our agency has done. I got to say, and you, those of you who know me must be tired of hearing me say this. We must reflect the community that we serve. And I got to tell you, I just got back, I don't know, a few months ago, September, October, I don't know when it was, we had our national, our, excuse me, our statewide uh, association conference, Cal Kappa did this, David Knight, shout out to you um, and the team. And I, I went in person and I sat in this room of probably 50 people, 60 people. And for the first time in my history of community action, nine years being an ED, there were Latinos in the room in the numbers that needed to be. There were Latinos in the seats at our meetings. And that inspired hope for me. It inspired pride for me because we in California cannot be a white network. We cannot. We have to reflect the community that we serve. And when that community changes, especially here in Watsonville, if that community changes and when it changes, because it will, then we got to change too. I should not be the executive director of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. We, ha we have changed and we have pushed and, we're, and we are committed to help support the indigenous language community. And I challenge you to think about who that is in your community. Who are those who are the furthest away from the system, right? Who are the furthest away from the systems? And how do we connect and build relationships? We have brought on promotoras, outreach workers with life experience. We have wonderful relationships with UC Santa Cruz, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and the Blum Poverty Center. And there's a Blum Poverty Center in most of the UC systems in the state of California. And they um, help to support poverty and participatory governance. And so they help us collect data. Um, and help us with the CAP plan. Those are important granitos, important relationships. Partnerships have saved us. Partnerships in COVID, when we were in Watsonville and nobody, none of the systems people were thinking about that undocumented mother with three children who didn't have information and didn't have access to masks, they, they weren't thought about on the first day. The day workers who immediately when shelter in place happened lost every opportunity for income because they do job matches, daily work. They lost every opportunity for income. They're not thought of at the top of the list. People don't remember. There's an invisibility, an invisibility to segments in our community. And so I wanna challenge you community action, national community action. Who are the invisible community in your areas? Push, ask, have courage, investigate. And bringing together, of course, a, a staff of committed and dedicated people to, who all support the value of equity and inclusion. Those are our little granitos, little granitos. Next slide, please. Here's some, some, some stories about community response, right? I talked about COVID and flood response and the partnerships that gave light, shown the spotlight on who was getting vaccinated and who wasn't, who had a mask and who didn't. We show the spotlight, we put the spotlight and systems responded. They resp responded with resources and funded and funding. They responded by acknowledging the need for an indigenous language line. They responded by, by ensuring that there was videos and communications in various languages. They responded by raising for CAB, for CAB $6 million went through CAB for COVID response. And we are just starting today flood response, direct assistance relief for people impacted because of their housing and because of loss of wages. And thus far, our community has $300,000 raised um, through our community foundation, but we expect that to grow very, very much quicker. I wanna say that we responded creating an equity strategy that included the commitment to reflect the community that included an, a formalized equity policy statement. Thank you, Helen, and our advocacy subcommittee for making that happen. 
that included a local network responding to racism as a public health crisis. That includes those conversations around equity, including my participation in the National Commission. And lastly, internally, we created an equity academy so that we can build capacity and invest in the next generation. Now it's our turn. Now it's our turn. We have to lift up the next level of professionals. We have to fight to invest in them. We have to ensure that they get heard, that they get the skill sets that they need so that they're ready. And they are ready. Boy, this younger generation of, of staff, they, they know what they're doing. And our job is to support, support them. Next slide, please. I wanna challenge you, Community Action, to think about equity in big and small ways and to elevate MLK's vision for justice. I wanna challenge us to be courageous and to be committed and to be in action. You know, our community action plan looks great on the shelf, but if we don't give it life, if we don't allow for it to, to help guide our services, if we don't use that information to determine what seats should be represented on our board, if we don't use that information as a tool for elected and decision makers to make their systems, system creators, to create their systems in a more equitable way, then we're not doing everything that we need to do. And so I wanna challenge us community action, challenge us to, to, to continue the fight. It isn't over, it's different. It isn't over. I want to also, be reflective before I move into the, my last two slides. I want us to be self-reflective because it takes courage to do equity work. It takes courage and it takes tenacity. And we need to, to one, see who we are and where we stand. I have a lot to learn. I have a lot of racial healing to, to unpack for myself. I have much growth to do and I have to understand that. And so I challenge you, I challenge you to think about those questions. Where do you stand and what can you do to learn more? And what can we do, those people of color on this call, to help heal ourselves for this work, because of this work? Healing is an important strategy in equity. Healing and well-being are important conversations to have at the same time that we're having conversations about activism and being in action. Many of you have learned I was able to do a 90 day sabbatical last year with, a thought, with only because of the board support and my incredible team at CAB that made it happen. I was allowed to step back to reflect, to rest and to connect with my family and my friends that I have not been able to do for many, 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 many years. And that little, that little way, that little way gave me 10 more years in the work that little way gave me 10 more years in the, in the work. And so I challenge you, I, I, wanna, I, I don't wanna say the word self-care because that gets thrown away and we think it's candles and sage and that stuff which are important, right? But I wanna challenge you to think about well-being and peer-to-peer well-being. We need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other. So that brings me to the last dicho that I want to highlight. And there we are again, me and my mama. It's my one of my favorites, right? Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you walk with and I will tell you who you are. And I want to honor our families. We cannot do this work without my sister. I can't do this without my sister Lily, who's on the call. I can't do this without my, my swim girlfriends, Gigi and Carolyn and Corinne, who get me to the pool once, twice, three times a week. I cannot do this alone. We cannot do this without our families. Next, next slide, please. And so who, I, I wanna take a moment and honor some action makers from across the nation, across the state, and in my little space in the world. And there's names there. It's not an exhaustive list. It's not even the beginning of the list. It's, it's the thought of the list. But these are some names that continue to, to bubble up because of your dedication, because of who you are, because of what you bring to community action, because of what you teach others. 
and names that are not there, like Greg Scott and Biz and Ajit and Jeremy and, and Brenda there's, and Biz. There's so many people who aren't on this list, but we know they are on our list in our hearts because that's what community action is. We are in action. We are not afraid to look at ourselves. We push ourselves to get better. We push ourselves to show up. We honor those who show up with us. We love the community. We listen to the community. We walk with our community. Muchísimas gracias por esta oportunidad. Oh, <laughs> we've had a motion in your room. There's motion around this country. You've you've stirred the room. If you see the love coming through the chat, it comes from deep inside. As you were speaking, as you were telling your story, as you were talking about your agency, you were talking about the families, the love coming through the chat. Um, I hope you feel it. Virtual sometimes it's tough, but the hugs coming to you are real. Um, they are there. You honor us with your story, your your call to action, and your presence today. So thank you. We did have um, a question come in. So it, I know we talked about some prearranged questions, but I, I let's center on our our folks who've come here today. Um, the person asks, how, do, how can we help our organization move toward um, a culture that truly reflects true representation? It goes to what you were talking about. And there was a lot of action in the chat about representation. Representation matters. And our, our network, our organizations, how do we encourage a generation of folks to come to this work through community action? There's many ways to serve our communities. We want folks to come through community action. Advice, suggestions, thoughts to the network on how we can help our agencies reflect the community in true and meaningful ways. Absolutely. That is a fantastic question. And, and whoever asked that question, you're already on the right track. And I'll tell you that when I first started a cab nine years ago, the very first task that I did is I sat with every single staff person and I wanted to hear their experience in community action. And I learned very quickly that there was a different experience for our Latino frontline staff and our, uh, our white staff. It was different. And so I, began, I I listened. And so that's step number one, listen and connect. Have the courage to ask the questions. Have the courage to talk to your board about it. Have the courage to talk to your teams about it. Because we let's just put it out there, racism exists. Mm -hmm. Community action isn't immune. Racism exists. And if we're not asking the questions, you on this call, 186 people, if you are not asking the question, then nobody's asking the question. And so that's step one, asking the question, looking internally, talking, creating a plan. There's an HR plan that can go with this, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen by magic. Like, you know, Jeannie, remember I dream of Jeannie, I just go like this and it happens. It doesn't happen that way. We, we analyzed all the positions at our agency. As positions opened up, we decided what really needed to be bicultural, bilingual positions. There were, posi all frontline were bilingual positions, but the next level were not. Now you tell me, there's a young person who gets arrested, mom doesn't speak English, she needs help. The frontline staff refers it to their coordinator and if the coordinator doesn't speak Spanish, where does it go? Mm -hmm. And so it matters to look at our positions, to look at what do we truly need, to look at our communities and who is the furthest away and begin making a plan to build those bridges. Thank you. Um, I think you provided both practical, ta tactical aspects to your response, as well as an impassioned call to leadership, right? Because agencies are of people. You have staff, you have staff leadership, you have boards, you have people within the organization at all levels. And you talked a bit earlier about the size of your organization. And sometimes, you know, are we, our community action agencies can sometimes think, well, we're different, we're unique. You're an $8 million organization. You run a lot of the standard programs that a lot of community action agencies have. 
and but you've centered yourself truly in equity in your community. Advice to leaders in this country who, you know, we don't have all the resources in the world. How are we going to navigate this as an organization? Any final advice you'd leave for your colleagues that you'd want them to take away? I think the most important thing, Denise, the most important thing is knowing where we stand with racism. Yeah. It's knowing how we hold it. It's knowing how we, we um, process it. It's knowing how we're triggered by it. If, we, if that is the granito de arena, if that's the piece of doing the self-reflective work, if we can invest in ourselves to do that self-reflective work and understand the layers that impact racism in our, in our beings, mm -hmm. then we can come together for a collective impact change. But we have to have the courage, Denise. We have to, be, we have, to have the courage to say, yeah, you know what? Some of those things I grew up with are racist. Yeah, you know that sense of urgency that Marilena does so well at her agency? It's white supremacy. We have to have that courage. And, and upon self-reflection to understand where the resources are. NCAP, you all provide amazing resources for us. We, some of us in California just got certified DEI certification at eCornell. That came to us by our association. Ask for the resources coordinate the resources. Um, uh, worst that can happen is they say no, <laughs> and then you do it anyways. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for being here. The, the love continues in the chat. So people really responded to you in terms of dialoguing with you um, in that space. Um, Thank you. We'll make sure to put those resources. We'll be sending a follow-up email to folks who registered today. We're not going to take time here today to, I don't think, walk through the remainder of the, you know, we have some slides and things like that, but we'll be sending some of that information out. Also, keep an eye out for our strategic plan where I hope that you see the work around equity, starting with racial equity, is also centered in the partnership strategic plan as we go forward. So, just on behalf of the board and staff, Maria Elena, thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We appreciate you. You are a blessing. You are you a blessing. Oh. You are a blessing. And this network is a blessing. This network, we are blessed to be part of this wonderful community. So thank you, everyone, for being with us here today. We will see you soon. Take care. And we're here. If you have any follow-up, emails, questions, comments. We're happy to talk anytime. So again, thank you everybody for being with us here today. Take care and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.